Rea chops it to third, down the line. Garcia will glove, he'll throw. Can't be dug out by Pasquantino. He doesn't see it. Julian makes third. Buxton scores. Correa is safe. It's 4-1 twins here in the ninth inning. This stuff was good. Um, you know, we get the, the three, two, two outs on three pitches in the first. Guy put a good swing on the on the 0-2 fastball for the home run and you know, Correa is obviously a tough out for a lot of a lot of pitchers, and so he battled him, got the the two out RBI, and he he was really good. Other you know, gave up a couple of runs. We'll take that every time out. I mean, the crowd was electric. The the fans were into it. Um, it was a good ball game. You know, we just you, you're not going to win a ton of games scoring one run. So we you know, if you're going to play against good pitching like that. You're going to have to figure out a way to scratch a couple across. Arizona's got to go quick here. Bradley, why not? Missed it. Clock ticks. And it is going to be the Crimson Tigers out of the ACC headed to the Elite Eight. Seven seconds to go. And they take it in with B.J. Davis. They put down two more. And that'll do it. This one's over. Connecticut is going to the Elite Eight. And the largest margin of victory Sweet 16 since 2017. NATO says no fouls. Carolina's got to go quick. They're down four. R.J. Davis to the baseline. Gives it to Baycott. It's good, but 1.2 seconds remain. Nelson to put him up three. And he missed it. And it's a... Oh, Nelson got the block! Game over! Sweet 16 is no longer sour. They advance to the Elite Eight for the first time in 20 years. Lipsy, and it's caught by Jones, and a shot inside by King, who will get it to great point two, and it's into Goody, the game is over, and Illinois is going to a regional final for the first time in Good morning, Kansas City. This is the Border Patrol on Sports Radio 810 WHB. It's Friday, March 29, 2024. Stephen St. John and Nate Bucati with Jay Gutierrez. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Today we'll talk to Stan Weber because it's Friday. Greg Gurley. Mike McFarland will have some postgame sound from the Royals opening season loss. Some basketball post game as well. What a loser of a day. Uh, uh, uh. Plus, hmm? you know we finally here, right? Well, we. It's Friday then. It's Saturday, Sunday. The Royals lose four to one to the Minnesota Twins. Then in the NCAA tournament, Iowa State lets me down. They lose to Illinois. Blech. I didn't care about Alabama or North Carolina. So hey, Your I, bracket's doing good, though, man. No, it's not. Arizona's uh, you're, out. You're one spot away from money. Yeah, but it, I'm, I'm screwed now. Arizona's out. Oh, not if UConn wins. Well, <laughs> UConn's going to win. I, I, they look all right. UConn's they look all okay. Right, yeah. I mean... We're in this big money deal. <laughs> You're ahead of me. You're ahead of a lot of people. I don't feel Chasing like Lebo. I had Alabama going to the Elite Eight. I didn't have Clemson. I, I had Clemson out in the first round. Clemson plus seven and a half. Coach Donlin. Clemson. Yeah, that's the only team that I was rooting for that, that won. Was 
Clemson because of associate head coach Billy Donlin, who was on the show this week. Yeah. And if they make it to the Final Four, he'll be on the show next week. Chase him down. And look, they got a shot. That, that's a surprise. Either Clemson or Alabama will be in the Final Four. Why not Clemson? Go Clemson. Get Billy Donlin in there. That's right. Um, man, Iowa State just came out of the gate slow. They could just – I mean, they never have a lead, right? They never had a lead. They just they just could never get over the hump, and uh, Illinois holds them off, seventy two to sixty nine. Uh, look, it's great. It's March Madness. It's this and it's that. But um, it's it's so stupid for them to start a game at nine fifteen. I mean, how late was that game on? It was past eleven. I mean, that was a that was a that was well past eleven. I mean, that was a fight. To stay up to watch yeah, that game. It's brutal. And I stayed up and watched the whole game, but it's just like, nah. if you're on the East Coast, how? You know, and, and like, it's certain, if you got, if you got any, any kids that are basketball fans, how you pulling that off? Unless they don't have school today, but it's just like, I mean, I feel like I'm a somewhat normal person. <laughs> I get up, but I get up earlier than most, but good God, I'm like, I want to watch this game. I want to watch the end of this game. But, uh... I mean, I'm just fighting it here. That was tough to get through. I mean, it wasn't the most beautiful brand of basketball, but it was at least dramatic, and I wanted to watch it. Um, so I was just fighting that. Uh, but, I mean, look, in, uh, anything could happen. I guess Illinois could, could beat them, but right now it, it almost kind of looks like last year, like nothing else is going to matter because because UConn. I mean, <laughs> they beat San Diego State by 30. They beat everyone by 20 and 30. It's crazy. They just beat the hell out of everybody. Yeah. The, the, you know, they won six games last year in the tournament to win the championship. And before last night, the first and second round games this year, and, and in those six, in those eight games, in those eight tournament games, their average margin of victory is 22. And so then they went up. They won by 30. I've never seen anything like that. I really haven't. It's silly. Over two seasons were now, now hey, you got the Elite Eight, and if they win that, you got the Final Four, and then you got the National Championship game. For someone, I'm not even saying for someone to beat them. For someone to challenge them, for someone to compete with them, do some someone do something. Well, we're not. <laughs> I mean, whatever. I mean, I I have them went into my bracket. Like Jake says, I'll give me some money, okay. And maybe maybe it's maybe it's Purdue. You know, maybe we have to wait to the national championship game and and we'll see this fabulous you know performance by Purdue or whoever they face. And then that'll that'll be the time they're challenged, and we'll see some flaws. And it's like I, you know, and I, I'm not interested. Well, they they lost in the regular season. I don't care. I don't care. Chiefs lost in the regular season. Guess what that meant? Guess guess what that meant? Nothing. It matters not. Especially when you're trying to stop this team from repeating. And so it's like we get all worked up about picking our brackets and looking at matchups and everything else. And for the last tournament and a half, it's, it's, it hasn't mattered. Because this is like, okay, you can't play someone, they steamroll them, move on. And so, well, you know, hey, San Diego State, maybe they get, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> nope. So now, hey, hey, Illinois. Now I wouldn't mind if it's another steamroll. I'm no fan of the Illini. But, I mean, just like the college basketball fan in me kind of wants me to see – you contested. And maybe maybe Terrence Shannon is so good, maybe he's the guy. What did he drop twenty nine last night? So I mean while dealing with foul trouble. But then again, maybe not. Right. Maybe maybe you guy just wins that game by sixteen and they move on. So you'll have at least on that side of the bracket, uh somewhat of a surprise Elite Eight with a surprise Entry into the Final Four, either Alabama or Clemson. 
and then UConn versus Illinois to see if there's a team that can do anything with UConn. Tonight should be some compelling games. I am looking forward to the games tonight. NC State and Marquette should be a fun watch. Uh, Gonzaga and Purdue should be terrific. Is Purdue, they have another chance to show that this is not going to be another March flop for them. And I like, I kind of like the idea of Gonzaga going on this yeah. run when, when people have, you know, go Zags. Well, this isn't, this isn't normally, you know, this isn't as good of a Gonzaga team as you normally see. And maybe this is the team that wouldn't this be funny if this was the team that finally won it all to get on their championship? Probably not, but you know, hey, they're alive and they look good. Duke and Houston feels like a battle of superpowers. Uh, Houston, please put us out of our misery. No more Duke. I don't want Duke. You know, Duke is Duke. They're on TV more than Thiva to Beva reruns. I don't think it, I mean, does anyone that's not a Duke fan actually root for Duke in a game? Certainly Duke is no. Duke. They're on TV more than Leave It to Beva reruns. I mean, you know, do they just like a, when you don't have a dog in the fight, does anyone ever just, ah, you know, I like, I like Duke to get some success here? No. No. No, they're like Kansas in that regard. What, what's that supposed to mean? Well, you've said it. You root against Kansas? When you're if, not... if you're not a Kansas fan, you root against I Kansas. I haven't said that. Yes, you, you just have. said that. No, I haven't. I was talking about Duke. What do you got Kansas you on You said that earlier this I week. Don't, I, don't... I don't remember that. Anyway, when you're really good. 6.15 a.m., Friday, March 29th, Nate compares Kansas to Duke as far as hatred. Yeah, I think that's fair. All right, then. I think they're pretty close. Out I think here? K- Kentucky, Kansas, Duke. I don't think anybody North Carolina, likes, yeah, probably. North Carolina. People get sick of them. They don't, you, nobody roots for Goliath unless they're Goliaths on. I don't know if Kentucky's Goliath anymore. I think we've gotten our fill of them <laughs> losing a lot. <laughs> but see, people still seem to like it. Yeah. People do enjoy when Kentucky yeah. loses. I think that might be the coach. Yeah, well. Yeah, well. And the fans. <laughs> yeah. The fans. The fans. I mean, you yeah. like you love watching a, a good meltdown. Yeah, I mean, I just, there's, I, I don't, I don't know, like, when Duke plays North Carolina, I don't, I don't, I don't know, I don't care, I don't, I want them, I, I don't have any. It used to be more exciting. Yeah, but also, like, yeah, you're not really rooting for either one of right. them, right? I don't like either one of them. Kentucky, yeah, you're right. I, I, I hope you, I hope Houston wins. There's no doubt about that. Right. I like Kelvin Sampson, and I would like Houston to be Duke. I'm going to be in Houston tonight, so I'm I'm hoping to find a spot where there's like you know a good Houston atmosphere. You think so? Watching the I game, mean, it's got to be somewhere in, in that. Yeah, um, my buddy of mine that I went to high school with lives down there, and he's he sent me a place. We're going to try to go watch the game. He said it'll be good. So he said he said people in Houston are fired up about it. Um, Why wouldn't they be? Well, you know, it's hard. And Houston's such a big it's town. It's a weird city, man. It's a weird town. And, you know, Houston's a. The number one, baby. I know. But how many people live in. I mean, there's so many more alums in, of like Texas A&M and, and things like that in, down in Houston. But. Seems like a lot more Astro fans than anything down there. A lot of Astro fans right now. I think Houston's been good long enough now under Kelvin Sampson where they yeah. would have attracted the bandwagon jumper, you yeah. know? Is, is there another is there another Texas school that's really capturing the basketball fans' imagination <laughs> right think, now? I don't think Baylor. so. Baylor, <laughs> right? But I mean, oh, I was being facetious. I, I especially like I, I don't know. I appreciate that style of play. I appreciate the way Kelvin Sampson's basketball teams play. That would be an easy bandwagon to jump yeah. on. Grit, especially, determination. Especially and then, even now, they go into the Big Twelve and kick the Big Twelve in the ass. Right. You know, for all the people that, oh, wait till Houston gets to the Big 12. We're going to show them. And Houston said, show me what? Show me that trophy. Seriously. Yeah. I mean, you were one of them. You oh, said, I'd... wait till Houston gets here. <laughs> then, <laughs> then, you, you, you know. I didn't, uh, I didn't think they were going to run through it. I thought that, you know, yeah, okay, it's one thing to post a great record when you're not getting tested game in, game out. They came in here, got tested game in, game out, and they passed the test with flying colors. And, and maybe part of that is they had a coach that already understood yep. what the uh, assignment was. Yeah. You know, he wasn't going to be surprised by anything. So, uh, th- hey, look, that'll be an easy route, route for Houston over Duke. And then uh, the game that I think will be the most entertaining, of course, 909, just to make sure that yep. 
This, as, as few people as possible can watch it. Creighton in Tennessee. Go Creighton. You know, I love watching Creighton play. And it, and I'm and I'm doing I'm doing this just to to attach myself to Gary Dieter at the hip. I love watching Creighton play. And I got good friends that went to Creighton. The man that lives in Omaha named Mark that I went to Pius with that yes, Covey. The the demands that we take phone calls and I and I he, he I go, you know why we don't take phone calls, Mark? <laughs> why? I said because I don't want to talk to people like you. <laughs> That's why. He's called in before. Oh, I know he's called in before. Yeah. He tries to get in. Yeah, and he has some real uh, spicy hot takes. I've talked to Covey Especially before. on Mondays after Chiefs games. Well. You don't let me come on there, Alt. Yeah. I'll, I'll set you guys straight. I said, I bet you will. We can, so we can stand to be. I've heard his straight. takes in the lunchroom at St. Pius, and that was that's where I left him. That's, another, that's one of my guys that was in my rotisserie yeah. league for all these years. What, Damn it! What's he doing? Like, he's not no. playing either. He was a big time. What's he doing? Not calling into the show from Omaha. <laughs> not playing in any roto leagues. Yeah, I don't know. Who knows? He's a mysterious man. But anyway, like you know, it, he, he's been a friend of mine for a long time. He graduated Creighton. Loves Creighton basketball. I'd like to see him be happy. I know some other people that are, that are, I care about that went to Creighton. Phil almost went to Creighton. That was his uh, third choice. I have two cousins that went to Creighton. Let's go Creighton. Yeah. And I really enjoy watching them play. I mean, that's the last team that's closest to us. Midwest school. Jesuit you know. school. Good Friday. You know, rooting for Creighton. Oh, yeah. Playing on Good Friday. Mm-hmm. Could be a great Friday for them. That's right. Yeah, the late start is not great. I don't love the games being played at the exact same time as well. I, obviously, I guess it helps the people that work a 9-to-5, but, man, I'd like it if they were spread out more so you could watch them all. I mean, it's all right on a Friday, but still, I mean, you think they'd stagger it a little more on a on a weekday? Last night was brutal. Yeah, that was rough. It doesn't help that that was the most exciting game that we were all looking forward to right. as well. Right. I mean, if that was UConn last night kicking the crap. Yeah. Good night. So it should be. Put right. UConn there because right. no one, you no one, know. Yeah, that game will be yeah. over by the right. first five minutes. You just have to watch till halftime and you <laughs> get the result. Not even. And also, the Royals lose to the Twins 4-1. to one. But you could take some good things away from it. I mean, you could certainly look at the start from Cole Reagans and continue to be super excited about what he – is capable of this year. Mm-hmm. Six innings, five hits, two runs, three walks, nine strikeouts. I mean, I mean, that's 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 ace type stuff. That's number one type stuff. I know Boddicker was all pissed off about the number of strikeouts yesterday. <laughs> Twenty strikeouts, this sucks. <laughs> you know. Oh, I lo- when I saw that text, I was like, oh, so on brand. But this this that was a battle yesterday of two of the best pitchers in the American League. Um, and and a battle between two teams that are in a me- mediocre division in the Central, and a battle between two teams that one of them is on paper better offensively, and that's why they're picked to win the division. You know, you heard Matt Quattrero and his comments into the in, in showing the show. You know, got to got to find a way. Got to find a way to scratch across more runs. Got to find a way to give Cole Reagan some more support. You know the the bullpen in a two one game. Got to keep it at two to one. Chris Stratton, one of the veteran guys they brought in to try to rebuild this bullpen. I know it didn't lose in the game, but you know coming up into the bottom of the night down two one is much different than down four one. Takes all the wind out of the sails. You know what I mean? Two mm-hmm. one, you're you're a bad pitch away from tying the game. You know, one mistake away from tying the game. But then four to one, it's like ah, well, there it is. You know that bullpen didn't do the job. Anderson did. Zerper did. Stratton didn't. But one guy didn't do his job. Then the bullpen didn't do the job. That's it. So, Cole Reagan's was good enough. The bullpen was not. 
And the offense, remember how terrible the offense started last year. Let's not go through that again. It was great to see Michael Garcia lead things off with a home run. As you know, I've, I've told you I believe he's on the cusp of a breakout season. And I know there have been people around here reluctant to include him, as a, as, even last year, to, to say that he was a guy that the Royals should build around. Well, the Royals believe that. And I've told you that they consider their four untouchables when people call and talk to them about trades, you don't ask about Bobby Witt Jr., you don't ask about Michael Garcia, you don't ask about Vinny Pasquantino, you don't ask about Cole Reagans. You can agree or disagree, that's how they feel. That's their nucleus. That's their untradeables. Those are the guys they have chosen to build around. The guy that's the, the, the fifth guy you would say that's on the eye, and I'm telling you how the Royals feel about this, not how I do, how the Royals feel, the fifth guy that's kind of teetering on that is Brady Singer. They like him. They want to build around him. They want him to be part of the future. But if he was part of a deal that got him something they really liked, they wouldn't say no to it. It had to be a great deal. You see what I'm saying, the difference? So he's, he's like, yeah, they like him, but they'd listen if it was the right kind of deal. And that's why I like the way the, the lineup's constructed. Garcia, Witt, Pasquantino. Those are the three position players that they want to build around, that they are building around. And then Cole Reagans on the mound. Every, everyone else is, is tradable. Everyone else is... Would they, would they, look, hey, would they love MJ Melendez? To have a fantastic year and show that he's a stud? Sure. But they had talks about trading MJ Melendez last year. He's been mentioned. I mean, Salvi, 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 man. At this point, I don't, you know, I don't know if there's a trade partner out there. And, and, that, and not, you know what? I'm good with that. They got to, that, for better or for worse, that window was missed you know to, to move him for max value or good value but he's clearly not he's still a really good player but he's on the downside you know this isn't this isn't ascending salvi or peak salvi i don't know where they're gonna get a hunter renfro michael massey they do love michael massey he started the year on the il but he's got to prove it he's got to show it he's got to do it Velasquez has a golden opportunity, a DH, to do something. But it shortened the leash to see what Nick Prado did in spring. And if Velasquez doesn't get off to a really – and they'll give, him, they'll give him plenty of time. They'll give him a good, a good shot to be productive in the DH spot. But let's say we're a month into this thing and Velasquez isn't hitting – and Nick Prado starts to tear things up and continues his hot spring at AAA, what do you think we're going to be talking about? You know? Yeah. And that's what you want. You want uh, ho- Hopefully Nick Prado pushes somebody. You know, and at least stays in the conversation. You know, and Kyle Isabel too. Same thing. He's got he's, he's to show that he's the center fielder. If not, Drew Waters could put pressure on him. And again, that's not a bad thing. So... I love the the top three. I hope Salvi can show that he's still a, a you know got enough power and I was gonna say play discipline, but I'm not anticipating that. But we love Salvi, you know. But after that, there's a, there's a lot to prove between Melendez and Velasquez and Isbell and you know guy Massey when he gets back. A lot of guys that have golden opportunities to show they're part of this this team moving forward, but. Yesterday, there was some good stuff to take away from it. The best thing is Cole Reagans looked like a stud. It's not his fault that the team didn't score enough runs. He pitched well enough to win. He had tremendous stuff. The 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 striking out the side swinging in the second inning was delicious. But you know, you, you, Matt Quattrero with the obvious statement: you're not going to win a whole bunch of games when you score one run. So it is. Doesn't matter how good your starting pitcher is, right? Yeah, yeah. So. That's it. Hey, 
Garcia had a good day at the plate. Bobby got on base a couple times, but didn't get anything from Vinny and Sal. It just and and I know Jake, you pointed this out. Once that shadow starts to creep across the field, and the pitcher standing in sunlight and the hitter standing in the shade, it's really really hard to see that ball. So and that, and that works for both sides. That probably had something to do with the twenty strikeouts. But hey, man, I'll say this. Minnesota Twins, Jake played it in the open. You get a great showing by Lewis to start the game, and then he pulls his quad, rounded second base. And winning opening day is great, but losing one of your best players to a muscle injury right out of the shoot is just a bad. That, that's, be glad that didn't happen to anybody on the Royals. Don't jinx things. Knock on wood. But, I mean, be glad it didn't happen on right. opening day because that seems like that happens a lot. Baseball is such a weird sport because you're standing around 95% of the time, then all of a sudden you break into a sprint. And it seems like how many times you see a guy does his hamstring or some kind of muscle injury in situations like that, and then they battle it because every time they try to come back, they re-aggravate it. It's just not the way you want to start off a season. So positive there for the Royals. That didn't happen to them. Royals lose 4-1 to to the Twins on opening day. We'll take a break. Back after this on WHB.
Welcome back to the Border Patrol on Sports Radio 810 WHB. Thank you so much for joining us. Stephen St. John and Nate Bucati with Jake Gutierrez, joined by Stan Weber in studio. Stan, good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. Good morning. Iowa State let me down. I'm mad. I wanted them to win, Stan. And I stayed up late to watch them lose. Maybe Sorry that's why to hear I'm that. Mad. Yeah. I, I, was, I, was, I don't know. I spend so much time surrounded by Iowa State fans during the Big 12 tournament, you know, because on the stage of the Fan Fest, it's almost like, I don't know, they leave a piece of them with me. <laughs> they adopted you. Right. I mean, they were so good in the Big 12 tournament. I'm thinking, you know what, maybe this is this will be the year, the first Final Four since 1944. For Iowa State, and then this last night, man. They you mean missed, they don't go to the Final Four every year? They missed so many layups and dunks, I stopped counting. How many, not, not I want to say easy, but how many shots that they normally make. But, I mean, it was there for them to win. Easy. You can use the word easy. And I was just, I was looking, I was, I was I looking never around, seen an uh, alley-oop dunk probability turn into an air ball huh? at a critical time or... Of the layup to tie when they're out in front and, and hit he's by himself. <laughs> I, go, oh, I mean, he's just like you're oh. totally jinxed. Yeah. What the heck? I mean, it, it's going to be hard to sleep at night. It those was. are the four of the easiest points ever. No defenders stopping them. Oh, the shot blocker. Nope, no shot blockers. They're out in front. That's four easy ones, and that's not the only ones. And Illinois had a terrible time with the free throw line. Oh, you know, yeah. that, that that game could have been put away earlier, but so. When they got Shannon in foul trouble, you thought, okay, this is the opportunity right here. He went for 29 points in just 22 minutes of playing time. Um, it, get, you got it. That's one of the things about the NCAA tournament to me, when you talk about like recipes for upsets and why the NBA – it's harder to pull off upsets because in one game, your best player gets in foul trouble, and all of a sudden, everything falls apart. Uh, NBA has six fouls. You rarely get in yeah. foul trouble. And, and and you play series. Your guy gets in foul trouble, and you lose that game. Well, we'll get him tomorrow. <laughs> you know, in the end, and that's why, like, when I saw that, I like, this is what needs to happen for Iowa State right now. They And, and then they, they stayed in the game, but they just couldn't take their opportunities too, too bad. Too well, bad. there's a yin and yang in everything, so – you know, don't want to upset anybody, but I was absolutely rooting for Illinois 100. percent Brad Underwood, absolutely, absolutely. I know Brad so well. His family, um, just amazing, amazing family, amazing human being. And uh, I like him, but I don't like Illinois. That's okay. You're a Missouri <laughs> guy too. You know, he. Did Missouri you guys th- don't like Illinois, and K State people don't like Iowa State, right? Ah, that's exactly right. Uh-huh. No, it's it's more about Illinois. Yeah, yeah. On that aha. Uh-huh. No, but it's hey. What was the last time they made it to Final Four? Forty four. Nineteen forty four. Yeah. So, like, is it, so as a Kansas fan, do you not like Illinois or Iowa State more? Like, who do you who did you want? I was rooting for I was rooting for Iowa State. Just you know, well, there's being some history there with Illinois. Big twelve school. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know that there's. I don't really have any any major feelings towards Illinois. Um, yeah, I mean, you have to be a Missouri fan to have any emotion about Illinois. They're just kind of a vanilla. They, yeah, they just seem like they just seem They've like great coaches roll through there, yeah. but they never the, like, make you upset. Like ah, oh, they're, they're cocky or they're they strike me as the most underachieving major state school in the country in sports. Well, that's that was crazy to hear that they hadn't been to an elite eight in nineteen years. Yeah, I mean, like, in, I mean, because bad like football. The only, the only thing I think of when I think of Illinois football is them running from the from the bragging rights game after they couldn't beat Missouri, <laughs> so they decided to cancel the series. But you just look at it and you go, okay, a state the size of Illinois with a city you know like Chicago in it, it's the only major state school that's in a Power Five conference. Where else in, in a league like the Big Ten? Where else is there a state like that, and the school just never seems to be great at anything? There are a ton of state schools, not in any major conferences, but right. there are a ton of state. I mean, I don't know 
too many other states that have as many state schools as Illinois. <laughs> but but they have the one that is the state school. Everyone right? wants to go to Illinois. Yeah, I mean, and it's like tough. I know it's tough academically and financially to get into because I went to school with a bunch of guys at KU that were from Chicago <laughs> that couldn't get into Illinois or, you know. He said that. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> I, I, I'm just saying. I'm just telling I mean, you. No, nobody in Illinois that went to other schools likes Illinois. This right. guy, this guy's an open book today. Earlier, he Woo. said uh, Kansas deserved to be hated like Duke or, around the nation. I'm like, well, okay. I mean, I didn't I say they deserved well, it. That's what you intimated. I didn't say uh, they deserved it. So I get it. I'm with you. You earned it. You earned it. Yeah. 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 They deserve it because of the kind of like the, being the Chiefs. Earned. The Chiefs have earned being right, hated there. by they everybody else yeah, in, the, uh, sure. in the NFL. Yes. Same thing. I'm with you. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but no, I don't. I don't. Um, I do like Brad Underwood a lot. And and oh, I listen, great. I love the story that Mike DeCorsi told us yesterday about when he was so frustrated with his team because they weren't executing what he had wanted after you know, during halftime adjustments and after a second timeout he just called a timeout and stared at everybody and just didn't say a word until they started talking to each other. I don't know. I like him. He seems like a very easy coach to root for. Yes, and Stephen, if you forgot that it's Illinois for a second, you love the opportunity to see your kids grow up and your boys and be involved with them as grown-ups. How about his son as his offensive coordinator? Uh, That's awesome. On on the bench, sitting right next to him, not just a GA, but an actual assistant coach. And I just, wow, I, I, my son Stanton grew up with him. I mean, those guys wow. hung out together. They were ball boys together at K-State. They, When we went to Hawaii and K-State played there, they, those two guys were together the whole time, talking about everything. Can you imagine you know, being 10 years old, 12 years old, and – hanging out around K-State basketball on a trip to Hawaii. Let's go to the beach. No, let's go shoot some <laughs> baskets. Let's let's talk. Yeah, what do you think about right. the NFL? Are the Chiefs ever going to get Patrick Mahomes? You know, they were just – it's so much fun to see the family, and his wife Susan's awesome. And, and it's a great story because he's a wealthy dude now, making tons of money, obviously, at Illinois. But it wasn't really that long ago, snap of the fingers, that he was getting almost nothing as a Florida ju- junior college coach. They were so poor. It was it wasn't too long ago. Kids. I mean, they were mm-hmm. that I sat in the conference room and took a cell phone call from him as he was uh, asking me. He was fact finding. He was asking me about uh, the UMKC basketball program and the possibility of being a coach there, and just to get my thoughts about the program and the leadership at UMKC and what the possibilities were there if a coach took that job. In that conference room over there, talking to Brad Underwood. Yeah, no doubt. Isn't that wild though? I mean, he, yeah. he was, oh, he, he, and he oh, was, yeah. and he, like, talking to him, it, it felt like, like, he wanted the job, and he was really, really wanting to know more about it, and, and I think about the list of, oh, can you get me going down that road, the list of coaches that UMKC had considered and not pulled the trigger on, and that was one of them, but, yeah, yeah, I mean, though, that, that's a, a, me, a with meteoric him, so rise. Tr- tracked his career, so, the fact that it seems so natural now that he is just making tons of money, and. I, I joke about it all the time. Even when he's an assistant coach, I go, look at you, man, Mr. Rich Guy. And he keeps telling me, do you know how much money I made five years ago? <laughs> hey, that gives you perspective, you know? Yeah, and, and it wasn't like he was 22 years old. It's more like right. he's 33 years old or yeah. 35 years old and still poor as can be, wondering if he's going to make it in the coaching world. And now he's going to the Elite Eight with Illinois. There's been, There's been a lot of interesting – Ties here with KU, K State, and Illinois basketball with Lon Kruger being oh, the coach, tons. Bill Self, mm-hmm. Bruce Weber, Brad Underwood. Mm-hmm. It doesn't Some seem like it's even possible you could say those names weird together. Kind of dynamic yeah. there. I know. Yeah. Because they're talking about Illinois success and saying, well, they did make the national championship game. That's Bruce Weber. Bill Self did some things there. Lon Kruger, I knew Lon so well. And when he went to Illinois, we actually went to Illinois. K State played at Illinois. So I've done a game there. And Lon Kruger was the coach. Hmm. Like, whoa, this is. Yeah, it just it seems so weird. They they there's a lot of good coaches that you just yeah, but those big off. names. Why haven't they? But had more winning. Yeah, nobody's really ever stayed there very long. It doesn't seem like either. But maybe Brad Underwood's the guy. I mean, it seems like he's had maybe a better run of success. Well, How many years have you been there now? About five? But he lost seven. so early in a tournament, was seven? it last year? Yeah. Yeah. Seven years. You know, so you say, oh, they're one of those teams. Yeah. Like Purdue. Mm-hmm. You know, another Big Ten school. Why don't you produce in a tournament? So this is big for him to go 
far always to get to the elite, elite eight is a big deal for any coach to get to that level yeah. is a big deal. But after they had six, you know, no success earlier, just like Purdue, it'll be more relevant if Purdue wins tonight and moves on to elite eight because they've been so ugly in the early tournament experience in past years. Well, if Underwood can pull out the upset against UConn, he becomes a legend. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a tall order, but yeah, I'll, be, I'll be rooting for Illinois in that too game. Too bad it's not Alabama and Clemson split <laughs> against yeah. Illinois and UConn. Yeah, the last time they made the Elite Eight was 2005, before that 2001, before that 1989. Wow. And then you got the football schools who were powers for a while, Alabama and Clemson going at it in basketball. That's crazy. And so we're rooting for uh, Clemson because Billy Donlin's the associate head coach, and he's on the show this week, and he's awesome. Great guy. Yeah. I'll tell you what, it was awesome having him on, too, because he laid out the game plan, and then watching that game unfold, they executed it exactly the way he said they needed to. I thought that was actually really fun because you could see exactly what they're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you knew what the, you knew what the game plan was. They executed it. They stuck with it, and it worked. It was like I actually enjoyed watching the game that much more because Billy was so articulate in laying out exactly how they were going to have to win the game, and that's great coaching too. I mean, I think that's one thing that Stan you talk a lot about with Bill Snyder of showing the team a vision. Hey, this is how we're going to win this game, and making sure everybody believes that's how they're going to go about doing it. And then you go out and execute it. That God, that's tremendous coaching. Really cool to see. You know, I've talked to uh, when he was at um, UMKC. I, I would talk to Billy Donlin about um, about the Clemson head coach Brad Brownell because he had, Billy had been there before under him, um, and they were talking about this in the studio after the game. That's an example of a guy that is stuck with the same school and has been there for a while. And all the, and, and, and you know, some of the Jay Wright and uh, they had Bruce Pearl in. Did you guys watch any of Bruce Pearl in the studio? I thought he was great. He's really good. Yeah. I like, you know, we can say whatever you want about Bruce Pearl and everything else, but it is a studio analyst and Jay Wright's fantastic. Cause there are some coaches and some studio analysts that you're like, why are they even in there? Jay Wright's and, good. Jay Wright was good. And I thought Bruce Pearl was really good talking about, uh, some of the different aspects of, of, of the game and why Clemson won. And they said, look, and you could tell that both those guys love him. Like, like he, We're so happy for him because he's a grinder. He's been there since 2010. You know, everyone really respects him. because, But that's also a comment on the school because he's. it seems like he's always on the hot seat, right? And they've stuck with him. And how long? I mean, you know that doesn't happen anymore. You're talking about 14 years of that school with – I mean, he made a Sweet 16 back in 2017, 2018. And that's really, that's the only postseason success he's had. And then he finally breaks through and gets to the Elite Eight. There's a lot of schools that wouldn't have let him get this far and stay that long. So that's kind of a good comment about both coach and school being loyal to each other. And after a decade and a half, it pays off. And we don't see that anymore. That's just that's just a rarity. Their football coach tenure and men's basketball coach, boy, is there anybody in the country that's even close to that right now? No. Because they've got two – though both their head coaches have been there a long time. And things are turning fast in that industry and faster as the transfer portal allows for players to play immediately and not sit out. So no one says you're building for something in the future. It's like, next year, we better win. Next year, we got the NIL money. That's right. But uh, I'm glad Clemson won, and I'll root for them against uh, against Alabama for sure. We'll take a break. Back after this on WHB.
be here in Boston. Um, you felt like we uh, uh, handled business, took care of what we needed to take care of um, in Omaha. Uh, two very good opponents, and um, you know, and I thought. Uh, uh, other than the start of the Moorhead game, I thought we played uh, played pretty well. Uh, now it's uh, on to a very, very good Iowa State team. Obviously, the uh... – And they took care of Iowa State. How about that? Now it's on to UConn. And that's a different animal. Where will Nate value UConn if they win another championship in two in a row? Because I I, there's know. a debate about should they be – when the conversation occurs, I don't hear their name. I hear Duke, North Carolina, Kansas, Kentucky. Nate, do you include UConn when you make that statement? Blue yeah, bloods, I mean, is I, that what you call I them? I think they have to be considered a blue blood at this point. We had that debate a lot last year, and when you know how many titles they have now, I mean, they've got they got a bunch, and they've got them through different coaches. I think that's kind of a big thing. Like I look at Villanova right now, and they've had good moments, but boy, Jay Wright leaves, and there's a huge drop off. UConn's a little bit interesting because they've had their ups and downs. They haven't just won year after year after year after year, but when they win, they win at a high level, and they've done it with different coaches. So to me. I don't see how you can deny their blue blood status at this point. And I will say, as a Kansas fan, I'm kind of rooting against them. I don't want them to win another title. That's, <laughs> that's, a, that's appropriate. You should you know, be. Yeah, I don't want them These to These are win. historic things happening. Yeah, and I, and I... Since we turned the calendar to the 2000s, yeah. have they won the most championship of, of anybody? And they won in 1999, 2004, 2011, 2014, and 2023. That's, give them a give them a back-to-back -back in there. Without 99, that's four, right? Has anybody else won four in... Man. And if you go 99, that's five, but that's not my question. Yeah, yeah. I don't, that's I don't, four with a chance for five. The teams that have won multiple, I would think, you know, Florida won a couple. North Carolina's won a couple, maybe three. And that uh, North Carolina's probably won three in that stretch, my guess. Kansas has won two. And you're asking since 2000? Since 2000, has, has uh, anybody won more championships? So after you come win a 99, and, uh, see, Michigan State, we'll keep track, okay? okay. Do this math. All right. All right. In 2000, Michigan State, 2001, Duke, then Maryland, Syracuse, UConn, North Carolina, Florida went back to back, so there's two. And the last back to back, right? Yes. Kansas. North Carolina, so there's two for North Carolina. Duke, so there's two for Duke. Yukon, Kentucky, Louisville, Yukon, Duke, so there's three for Duke. Villanova, North Carolina, so there's three for North Carolina. Villanova, so there's two for Villanova. Virginia. COVID, Baylor, Kansas, so there's two for Kansas, and then UConn. Yeah, so UConn's got the most. Duke and North Carolina with three. Kansas, Florida, Villanova with two. You yeah, and then you just go with four? Four UConn. And you don't even yeah, count yeah. the 99, which yeah. would be five. Right. Crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Who's the dominant program in college basketball? I mean, they've got, when it comes to national titles, it's them. And they are dominant right now. I mean, that's the thing is, like, the, the NCAA tournament, it, it, if you want to be upset-proof, just go beat everybody by 20. If you're that much better than everybody, then you can get one of your star players in foul trouble and still go win. You know, you were talking about blowouts, teams doing it back-to-back -back years. The closest thing I could think of was UNLV back in, like, 90-91, and they lost that game to Duke the second year, um, you know, in the, in the Final Four. So, and, and, and UNLV wasn't this dominant even, and they, they were pretty dominant. All time, if UConn wins this year, they'll break a tie with Duke and Indiana because those schools have five. They would then tie North Carolina with six, and then the only two teams ahead of them would be UCLA with 11 and Kentucky with eight. Oh, but they're not a blue blood. Was that a debate? <laughs> there was a debate about oh, yeah, this? Was a debate. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, we went through this all last year. You don't like new members. They, they're creating their own club. 
Is this only 20th century blue bloods, not 21st century? These other schools need to catch up to UConn. UConn doesn't have to prove anything. UCLA off the charts in the 21st century. Let's take UCLA out yeah. and put UConn in as the greatest program. And well, you they guys win don't another give him one. any respect. Yeah, zero you beat the respect hell out from him. This year. Yeah. You beat him. I mean, yeah, yeah it basically house. shows Kansas. You, you know, beat them. Best head team head. You're like you're this like year. Buffalo with these regular season wins now. This is what you're doing. You see that? I, I feel like I just flatly said that UConn's a blue so. blood like a minute ago. I'm rooting you, you, against you, them you, because you, I don't you, want them to have more. This even is very more you said, it, you said this, it with tongue firmly <laughs> in cheek. <laughs> uh, rooting against teams is just as passionate as rooting for. And you're rooting. You need to be rooting against UConn. It, it, it ain't going to help. You got three, to- you got three times. <laughs> yeah. It ain't going to help. You rooting against three them. games <laughs> that you need one of those losses. Come on, Brad Underwood. You do not want another national championship on UConn's can, but, ledger. I, but honestly, can they get, like, like I said earlier, before last night, if you factor in last year's tournament games and this year's tournament games, it's an average win margin of 22. And it went up last night because it won by 30. Crazy. I mean, can they, can they I, just think if they do that. Like if they win the next three and they're all double digit wins, then you got to talk about this two year stretch. You can put that up with any two year stretch of any college basketball team of all time. Do That's get, how dominant this and is. And they got the third best Hurley running the show. <laughs> and he's pissed I mean, off his right dad, now. <laughs> his, his dad is famous. His brother's way more famous. And here he is dominating, maybe. Two years in a row. It's three big wins away, though, Nate. Anything can happen. He's going to get Alabama or Clemson, though, too, like in the in the Final Four, if he gets past Illinois. I mean, that's going to be an unfair fight. I think it's going to end up who, who they play in the national championship game. It's going to have to be like that. It's, it's, Purdue, yeah. it's Purdue. It's whoever it is. But, look, it, that's the great thing about March Madness. Normally, is anything can happen, but for the last tournament and a half, nothing can happen when UConn plays except the blowout. We'll take a break. Back after this on WHP.